Thanks for the kind introduction. And <clears throat> as Lauren said, I mean, I spent four uh, amazing years at the ICGB as a PhD student. And, um, and then I moved after, after my PhD, I moved to, the, to Cambridge to the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology. And I actually joined in January, 2020. And then since the pandemic started, we, we actually reconverted the whole lab in working on SARS-CoV-2 and in particular, we, uh, we investigated the role of the SARS-CoV-2 spike cleavage, either in the virus entry and cell suffusion. So I will talk you through about all the work um, that, that, that we've been doing. Um, just, <clears throat> just a bit, in, um, a small introduction on the SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 is, um, SARS-CoV-2 particle um, is, uh, is, is actually an envelope virus. So um, it's mainly composed by four structural proteins the nuclear protein, which is actually complex with the genome or the genome with a, with a, sing, with a positive single strand RNA. And the viral particle on the, on the envelope is, uh, contains four, uh, three structure proteins, the membrane protein, the envelope protein, and probably the most famous protein um, on earth now, which is the, the spike, the spike protein, just because, you know, the spike is very important for the binding to the receptor and entry into, and entry into, into the target host cell. And um, in particular, also because you know, the spike protein is the main target for vaccines for um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So once the virus enters the cell, the, sing the positive single strand RNA actually allows the ribosome to actually attach to it and start the translation of protein. Either non-structured protein to allows the virus to, to actually start its, its replication and also structured proteins like the S, the E and the M protein, which actually localizes to the endoplasmic reticulum and it takes part to the, to the assembly for um, which leads then to the release of the virus from the cell. So um, the, main, the main part of, uh, so the main step of the coronavirus uh, replication is of course the entry and in particular, the spike protein, which attaches to the receptor, which in this case is, is ACE2. The spike protein is a trimeric protein, and um, it's, it's mainly composed by three, three main regions. It's, there is a cytoplasmic tail, a transmembrane region, and an ectodomain, who is in turn composed by two major regions, which is the S1 region, the S1 subunit, which is the subunit that attaches to the host cell receptor through the receptor binding domain. And is actually able to shield the S2 region, which is the fusion, which contains the fusion machinery, which allows the virus to fuse uh, the viral cell mem the, the viral membrane with the host cell membrane. When the spike protein is, is initially translated, the S1 and the S2 subunits are, are actually covalently bounded. Then the, the spike gets cleaved by some cellular proteases um, at the boundary between the S1 and the S2 subunit. And this is a very important step for activating the spike because when the spike then gets incorporated into the viral particle and it binds to the receptor, um, that in this case is H2 through the receptor binding domain in the S2 region, it triggers some kind of conformational changes and exposing the S2 site, S2 prime site. Uh, which is a cleavage site which is targeted by some cellular proteases present on the cell host plasma membrane, like, uh, like one protease, which is quite famous, and it's the TMP, it's called TMP RSS2 protease. This protease actually cleaves within the S2 prime site and exposes the fusion, the fusion peptide and allows the virus to actually fuse the viral, the viral membrane with the cell host membrane. So we have two different cleavages. The first one, which occurs um, during the production of the spike at the S1, S2 site, and the other one which, which occurs after the binding uh, with the host cell uh, to the host cell receptor. And this is, this is clearly shown also in this very nice video where you see the viral particle with, with, which actually attaches to the S2 receptor, and then TMP uh, cleaves the spike, releasing the S1 subunit and exposing the fusion peptide and allowing the virus to actually fuse his, his virus, his, his, cell mem his, his membrane with the host cell membrane. So what makes the SARS-CoV-2 virus so special and different from the other viruses in the, corona, in, for, in the coronavirus family? 
Um, in particular, in the in the spike pro in the spike protein, there are some there are some changes, and one of the, one of the most important changes is the acquisition of some multi basic amino acids close to the uh, the S1 S2 cleavage site. And, and as you can see, this uh, this contains several arginine, so that's that's been called the multi multi basic site, also because it also because it contains several uh, multi um, basic amino acids, and. This sequence actually resembles um, um, a sequence uh, which is recognized by one of the most abundant and ubiquitinously expressed proteases within our, our cells, and it's the furin. Furin is, is really abundant in our cell. It has several substrate, mostly mammalian substrates like hormones or growth factors and also enzymes. And since it's quite abundant in our cells, furin has been exploited by several viruses, um, which actually um, you know, hijack the furin to actually cleave their, their, their protein to activate their, their, their own proteins. So most of the studies, since, since furin is quite important because it allows the first cleavage, so let's say the activation of the spike, most of the effort is actually focused on targeting this furin with, with some antivirals and try to inhibit, the, to, to inhibit completely the, uh, rep, the activation of the spike and so the infectivity of the virus. Most of these studies have been carried out using some chemical inhibition or sRNA depletion, while we wonder whether the furin was really essential for this, um, for this kind of, of activation. So we didn't use any chemical inhibition or sRNA depletion, which is not ideal for these kind of studies, but we used two different approaches. The first one is to create a CRISPR-Cas9 derived um, cell line, which was knockout for furin. As you can see here, this is furin, and in our cell line, the furin is completely knocked out. And then we used a biochemical approach, so to where where we mutated the multi-basic site. So we took out all the all the arginines, all the basic amino acids, and we replaced them with the glycines and serines. Or either we completely deleted all the the multi-basic site which was acquired, leaving just one arginine to resemble what happens, for example, in SARS-CoV-1 virus. In order to investigate the cleavage of the spike when, when it was incorporated on, on a viral particle, um, we used what, what they are called HIV spikes pseudotypes, which are HIV variants, which were engineered to contain SARS-CoV-2 spike on, on their surface. So what we did was to produce these particles and purify them and run them on West blot to actually look at the spike cleavage, either in absence or in presence of furin. So we produce a cell, we produce these, these viruses either in 293T cells or in 293T's furin knockout cells. What we found was that when you produce these viruses in presence of furin, you see that wild type spike gets cleaved mostly in, let's say, 180%. While the GSAS mutant, so the one which does not have any, any, any arginine, the, the cleavage is completely, is completely abolished. And the same is for the Delta MBS mutant. But more interest, interestingly is, is this, is when we produce viruses in absence of furin, the spike still gets cleaved. Um, the the wild-type spike still gets cleaved, although in, in, in a lower amount, while the GSAS and the Delta MBS mutant still, the cleavage was still um, completely abolished. So here, let's say that, that we used HIV viruses, uh, which contain spikes on, on their surface, but we, we use a kind of chimeric virus. So HIV virus assemble in a different way from coronavirus. For example, HIV assembles and takes a spike at the plasma membrane, the cell host plasma membrane, while the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, acquires the, 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 pro, the, the structure protein, as I showed you before, in the, in the yard and through the ergic. So we wanted to get closer to this situation, to the, let's say, the wild type situation, the virus wild type situation. So we produced what they are called virus-like particles or VLPs. These VLPs can be easily, well, not easily, but produced in, uh, in cells, just co-transfecting the four structure protein that I showed at the beginning. So the spike, the E, the M, and the nucleoprotein. This assembled in a virus-like manner. And so it's, it's a more reliable way to actually look, um, look for cleavage uh, with, with, with a specific localization of, of all the structure proteins. So we produced these VLPs, we purified them, and then we, we did exactly the same. We ran them on a Western blot, either in the presence or absence of furin. And what we found was that exactly the same situation as the HIV virus pseudotypes, where the wild type was mostly cleaved, 
while um, in, in presence of furin, while the, the water was still cleaved in absence of furin. Then we, 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 we want to finally confirm these results. So, so we, we took the SARS-CoV-2 wild type virus. Um, we infected 293T cells or 293T furin cells, delta furin cells. And what we, uh, and pu purify the particles and we run them, run them on, on Western blot to look for cleavage of the spike and we see exactly the same, the same thing. So, so with, with, you know, with the spike, which was still, get, was still cleaved in the absence of furin. So this, this points and indicates that the furin is not completely essential for spike process, but there must be some other proteases which are actually able to cleave and activate the spike. So we went, then, we went then further and say, well, what's the relationship between having a cleaved spike with infection? Does, is there a kind of different relationship um, between infectivity and spike processing? Um, so in order to introduce this, um, this topic, I just want to point out that the coronavirus usually um, enters in two different ways. We have a fusion, what is called fusion at the plasma membrane, where you have TMP or SS2, which localizes to the plasma membrane upon the receptor, um, it the spike exposes the S2 prime site where TMP cleaves and exposes the fusion peptide and allows the release of the genome into the cell. And another way, which is called endosomal growth, where the, after the attachment to the host cell receptor, the spike gets incorporated into the endosomes. And here they, he finds another other proteases, which are called catepsins, which are less specific than TMP or SS2 and are still able to cleave the spike in multiple position, eventually exposing the fusion peptide and allowing the fusion between the viral membrane with the endosome membrane. In order to, uh, let's say, to, to investigate the infection in, into, into these two different routes and in the presence of, of different mutants, um, we use these uh, spike pseudotypes also because we can, we, we can use this because as, as I said at the beginning, these are HIV viruses with the spike on the surface, but they contains, um, um, they, they encode for a, G, for a glymphorescent protein, so for a GFP. So upon infection, you can easily see all the cells that were infected because the cells um, will, start, uh, will start expressing a GFP. So you can easily monitor, monitor the infection of, of these viruses. So we, we use these viruses with different, with, and with a different mutant and produce in different conditions, either in the presence or absence of furin. And we infected 293T cells that stably overexpresses the S2 receptor to actually look at the infectivity and whether the cleavage impact on the infectivity. And what we found was something surprising. Uh, and is that when we had a, a, a spike that was mostly uncleaved or completely uncleaved, like in the presence of the GSAS, the infectivity was, was slightly higher, but the virus was still able to enter the cells. This can be due to the fact that, um, that, that these 293 Ts somehow have very low levels of TMP or SS2. So we wonder whether the, as, as I said, the catepsin is actually less specific than, than, than TMP. So we wonder whether this route was actually, was actually favored in, in the absence of a pre-cleaved spike. So in order to test this route, we, we used an, an, somal, an, an inhibitor, which actually inhibits this, this route and it's called E6040. And actually what we found was that this, the same infection was completely abolished in the presence, um, in the presence of, 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 this, of this inhibitor. Then we wanted to go in a kind of different setting and in a more complex um, system which actually expresses a high level of TMP and see whether this situation was completely reverted. And so we took these viral particles and we infected some intestinal organoids, which actually been shown to express high levels of TMP RSS2 and TMP RSS4. And what we found here was exactly the opposite situation. So when you have a precleaved spike, then the virus enters thanks to this TMP RSS2. And this is uh, this is this is a quite a quite important important point because uh, it says that that the cleavage of the spike is not totally is not important for the entry of the virus because the virus can enter either in 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 the endosomal route so either either using another other proteases rather than the TMP. Then then we went further and we were like well since the spike is not important for for uh, the, the furin is not important for spike cleavage and the spike cleavage is not important for infection. 
So is furin somehow important, essential for SARS-CoV-2 replication in general, so for in other steps of viral replication? So we took the virus and we infected either 293T cells or 293T delta furin cells. We left the virus to replicate in 40, for 48 hours, and we quantified the viral particle either by using a plaque assay or look, uh, and look at the cleavage of the viral particle using Western blot. And surprisingly, what we saw was that the furin, um, knocking out the furin does not, I mean, let's say the impacts the, the infectivity of the virus, but does not completely abolish that. So this actually says that the furin is not essential for either, either spike cleavage or infection and SARS-CoV-2 replication. So then, then we wanted to investigate whether, you know, the, the SARS-CoV-2 has this peculiarity with this acquisition of this multi-basic site, which may be targeted by furin or by the other proteases, as, as I showed you earlier. So we, we question whether the acquisition of the multi-basic site may be important in other steps of viral, re of viral replication or virus spread, uh, rather than only infection. So uh, let's say that, that we, we investigated the uh, different, um, different rules of, of the spike cleavage in different ways of the virus spread. So the virus, let's say that the virus spread in two different ways. There is one way, which is which I like to call the classical way, uh, where, where you have an infected cell, you produce this virions, which actually gets out from the cell and attaches to the host cell receptor on the neighbor cell and then infect the other cell. And there is another way, which is much more clever, and is that an infected cell starts to produce the proteins and then localizes the same protein that you find on the virion, so that which allows the virus to, end, to fuse the, the, the viral membrane with the cell host membrane, they localize these proteins to the plasma membrane of, of, of the infected cells. In this way, this cell acts as a giant virus. So when this protein actually binds to the receptor, it acts as a giant virus. So it can fuse the membranes, instead of fusing the membranes of, of the virus, it fuses the membranes of the cell. So it, fuse, it triggers this formation of of cell cell fusion of of synchytia formation, so big big cells, multinucleated cells, and of course in the co in the case of um, SARS-CoV-2, um, spike is is mediating this process, so it localizes to to this membrane and and triggers this cell cell fusion. And there is a very nice paper from Mauro Jacques' lab, who's actually showed uh, that that this, this process is really important also in vivo because you, you, you find these abnormal cellular synchytia and they contribute to the COVID-19 gland pathology. In order to test whether the, the, the cleavage of the spike is, was important for this, for this process, we decided to investigate this setting up a, um, a cell cell fusion assay where we have, where we employ two different set of cells. We have a donor cell, which mimics what is an infected cell. So we transfected the spike into the cell, and then we co-transfected the same, the, the spike with a fluorescent protein. And this mimics what is an infected cell, right, what I showed, what I showed you before. And then we used um, another set of cells, which we, call, which we call acceptor cell, which expresses the receptor ACE2, and it's labeled with a different dye, in this case, it's a green dye. So upon the interaction between the spike and the ACE2, it starts to, the, the diffusion starts and you create this, um, this multi, these multinucleated cells. You can easily see this, um, follow this kinetics of fusion using this incusite, which is an incubator, which allows you know, to take in images at different time points and, um, and then draw a graph of the kinetics of the fusion. And this is something we can, we can see here. So you have these two cells which come together they, um, they, they, they create this connection between um, these membranes. And then the, suddenly this, 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 this cell starts to fuse and, they, then, and this, this fusion cell that starts to become bigger and bigger. So um, we, we wanted to, to, to investigate one important question in terms of cell cell fusion. Uh, and this is the following. So does the SARS-CoV-2 spike is able to mediate cell cell fusion between different cell types? And this is an important question if you think in a complex organ where you have different cell types. So if a virus is actually able to spread from one cell to another, um, from one cell type to another, it gives the virus a very big advantage also because it can avoid the extracellular environments where, for example, antibodies are. So it can avoid the, to encounter all the antibodies that can neutralize the the virus, and so the virus can spread, let's say, virion independently. 
So in order to test this hypothesis, we used two different set of cells. So we used two nitric T cells and Vero cells. Um, and, and we used them as either as a donor cell or as acceptor cell. And what we found was that either you use uh, Vero cells, either with the two nitric T's or, or the other way around, you still trigger um, the, uh, this very nice um, synchitia, this very nice cell cell fusion. And these synchitia are quite big with more than 30 nuclei per um, per syncytium. So then, then, what, then, then what we did was to actually express, then what we noticed, and since we know that the TMP RSS2 was very important in triggering diffusion process, we overexpressed TMP RSS2 in these cells here. Um, and what we found was that when we overexpressed TMP RSS2, the, the formation of syncytia drastically increases. Then, so having set up this assay and have, having the opportunity to actually follow also the kinetics of this, so we started wondering what was the role of furin and the role of the multibasic site in the formation of this um, synchitia. So um, in order to do this, we used, uh, we, we employed cells which actually were knocked out for furin either as a donor cell or as acceptor cell. And what we found was that we still can see some kind of Synchitia, which were formed, although with a very with a very low rate, but surprisingly, is that if we if we use our mutant, the, G, the GSAS mutant, remember, was the mutant that was not able to get cleaved at all, then the cell cell fusion is completely is completely abolished, and as you can see also from from this quantification, so this points out that the furin is not completely essential for cell cell fusion because you still have partially cleaved spike as I showed you at the beginning, so this can actually mediate the cell cell fusion, but the spike multibasic site is crucial for this process. Then since we have noticed that the TMP RSS2 is actually able to enhance this process, uh, we, wonder, we wonder whether uh, this TMP RSS2 needs a specific requirement to actually trigger the, uh, the cell cell fusion. One of the questions that has been in the field for some time is that, is the TMP RSS2 required in both cell lines that um, in both cells, which actually um, one which accesses the spike and the other one which does not. So, or um, it needs a specific orientation to, to actually access the S2, the S2 prime site to trigger diffusion. So what we did was to either um, express cells, um, either knockout cells uh, for TMPRSS2, either in the donor or in acceptor cell. And what we found, um, was that in the accept when we knock out the TMP RSS2 in the donor cell, so the cell that which contains the spike, but but you still have TMP on the opposite cell, so the acceptor cell, you're still able to trigger this very nice cell cell fusion. But when you knock out the TMP on the acceptor cell, then the cell cell fusion was was completely abolished. So this means that we need TMP RSS2 on the acceptor cell to actually. Uh, trigger the cell cell fusion. This has an important implication because this can can give um, an idea of the of a susceptibility of cells in a complex setting like in an organ. Because having high levels or no levels of TMP RSS2 can actually can actually drive the formation of the cell cell fusion and and allow the virus to actually spread from one cell um, to to another. Then let's say in conclusion we. We challenged what has been in the field for a while, and is that the furin was essential for virus replication because some our genetic knockout definitely showed that that the furin reduces but does not completely prevent SARS-CoV-2 replication because other proteases must be capable of cleaving the spike. Um, this paves the way to the use of different cocktails to, to inhibit SARS-CoV-2 replication because the furin targeting drugs, the only furin targeting drugs may not completely, completely block the SARS-CoV-2 replication. And we also point out a very important point, and was that the, the cell cell fusion, the synchitia formation, can be a potential target for therapeutic strategy. And this has been beautifully showed by, by Luca and, and Ashim in, in this Nature paper from Mara Jack's lab, who actually showed that this cell cell fusion is, is definitely a, a draggable target to inhibit the SARS-CoV-2 replication. And so, so in the meantime that we were doing this work, it was, uh, it was I think, uh, December or January, and we started facing a new chapter of, of the pandemics, and it was the SARS-CoV-2 variant. So a lot of variants starts to, to come out, and it started to 
to threaten the, the, the whole world. So, you know, all the newspaper that title the mutant virus can be more deadly and the mutant virus is spreading. And for, for virologists, for us, it's, uh, it's something completely normal because the virus, when, when you let the virus amplify into the population, it starts to adapt and, and of course, uh, evolve. And despite the fact that we have several vaccines uh, already, already in line and, and administered, there are several variants which are, come out, which are coming out. So it can somehow threaten our, um, our vaccine program. And I like, I like to think this as a kind of um, game chess where you have to know the, the enemy's move in advance uh, to actually move your, your pieces. And, and, and in this case, to actually adapt our vaccines to, to every different strain. And the only, the only way that you can actually know the, 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 um, the SARS-CoV-2 move is, is actually the sequencing. So to sequence as many viruses as possible and to characterize them um, to actually know whether whether these can these variants can be can threaten our our vaccine and so can escape our our immunity um, given by vaccines, and this has been a great effort for for whole the world. And some countries did better than others, let's say, and um, and that they identified some some variants like the the um, in South Africa it was it was identified this variant which which actually was shown to be to evade the the immunity that was given from some vaccines. Um, the same in Brazil, it was, um, in, it was this variant of concern. And also, of course, in the United Kingdom, um, which actually showed um, no, no, let's say, no, not, not escape from, from the um, um, neutralizing antibodies, but it, it, it actually showed high transmissibility and probably also um, high lethality. And this is something we can we can see in this graph. So if you think that in the United Kingdom it was it was January or December, January when this 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 variant took over, and then it reaches so it started a third wave of, of infections, and which actually led to more than 1,300 deaths per day. This variant is, um, is is super spreading throughout the world, as you can see here. And also in Italy now, we, we have now more, more than 90% of all the variants are the B117 variants, is the UK variant. So the mutations uh, which occurs in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, of course, it will it will affect all the different genes. But in particular, we are we are focusing on one particular gene, of course, is the spike protein, also because it's targeted, it's the targeting of our of our vaccines. And so mutation in the spike can actually tra threaten the, our immunity um, that, which is given by vaccine. And as you can see, a lot of several mutations has been identified um, throughout, throughout the spike gene and in particular in the receptor binding domain, which, were, which are the more concerning one. But what we focused on and was really interesting was not a mutation, but a modification of, of, of the genome of the spike protein. And it was this, this deletion here of deletion of the histidine environment position 69 and 70. This is because this mutation is, is actually uh, found in these two external loops here. And in particular, this mutation was also, was always found um, in couple with, with some particular mutation in the receptor binding domain. So either the 501 or the N439 or the Y453. And this, in particular, this mutation in the receptor binding domain has been seen to actually evade the antibody uh, mediated response, or like in the case of Y4453, um, it, was, it was increasing the, the, the affinity to the, to the ACE2 and actually was acquired in minks. If you remember, there was a story where all the minks, all the minks were, were killed because, because, of, of, because this mutation actually arise in there. So we started wondering why this mutation, why this deletion was actually occurring with all, with all these mutations, what was the relevance of this? So together with Professor Gupta at the Cambridge Institute for Therapeutic Immunology and Infectious Diseases, um, what we did was to produce some mutants of, of, of these, some, some mutants, some spike proteins harboring mutations in, this, in these sites. And what we found um, was that when you were introducing this mutation, the infectivity of the pseudoviral particles, so the HIV pseudoviruses that we used, was drastically decreasing. While, while you adding on top the, this deletion, somehow the, this was rescuing the infectivity. So it seems like that this, this deletion actually increases the spike infectivity to compensate for some deleterious deletion that can happen to the 
in the RBD, in the RBD uh, domain, which actually would have allowed to have higher ACE2 binding, like in the, in, in the case of N501Y or the N439K, or either escape from some neutralizing antibody. So it gives you, it's, it's, let's say that it's a compensating mutation. Or interestingly is, is that in our beloved B117 variant, uh, that, that is the UK variant, uh, this deletion is, is actually present also, also, also in, this, um, in this variant together with, the, with this mutation in the RPD. So what we did was to, to restore this, this, this deletion into the B117 spike. And what we found was that the restoration of this deletion drastically impact the infectivity of the virus. So it seems like that the that the B117 actually requires the, the, this deletion for efficient infectivity. And this, this has been seen also you know, in different contexts, but also in terms of cell cell fusion, when you when where the B117 is more much more fus it's more fusogenic than the wild type one, but when you repair the deletion of the histidine 69 and the violence 70. In the end, I just want to to acknowledge the, the LMB, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, who actually allowed us to work in the pandemic period, and in particular, my group leader, Leo James, and Anna and Donna, who were beautifully working on, on, on SARS-CoV-2 and especially on the fueling, on the fueling work. Um, and of course, all the people who actually contributed to, to, to this work. And you know, the whole, all, all the slides that, that I showed you and all the results was was a um, collaboration effort for, with um, with the University of Cambridge, and in particular with Professor Ian Goodfellow, who actually gave us the virus for to, to start the experiment in BCL3, and Matthias Zimbauer and Francesca too for for providing us the intestinal organoids, and uh, in the end also Ravi, which we keeps collaborating to actually to actually monitor the the appearance and you know to the characterization of the, all the uh, different variants that are arising throughout the world. Um, and of course, I, I thank you all for, for your attention.